My name is Bertrand Lachapelle. Uh, I'm currently the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, but also a director on the uh, board of ICANN. And I used to be the uh, ambassador for France for uh, internet related issues. What I want to talk about today is ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is one of the components of the ecosystem of governance that has emerged progressively to handle internet related issues. I'm talking about an ecosystem of governance because actually um, the internet, as you know, is one of the most uh, unique collaborative uh, endeavors that humanity has ever undertaken. It's a very distributed system and basically any network can join the internet just by respecting the protocol of the TCP IP. So the internet has grown from a few uh, university users to more than 2.5 billion and probably 3 billion soon of users by the coherent behavior of a very large number of actors who are laying the pipes, who are setting up applications, who are doing the infrastructure, but also developing the layers of content and so on. And it is no surprise that actually the governance mechanism for this very distributed and collaborative system has to be, as innovative as the structure is, distributed and collaborative as well. So what I want to highlight here is that there is a sort of distinction in the layers of the internet between the physical infrastructure layer, like the cables, the towers, all the uh, connectivity display uh, apparatus, there's another layer which is the logical layer, uh, the addressing system, the domain name system. And there's a third layer, quite simplified, about all the applications, the World Wide Web, the apps that we're using, and all the email and, and content layer. ICANN belongs to this intermediary layer, the so-called logical layer, the governance of the logical layer of the infrastructure. ICANN is not alone in this, uh, in this space. And actually, its mission is to coordinate the allocation and management of what is called the unique identifiers for the internet. To simplify, the whole internet functions with the so-called IP addresses, internet protocol addresses that are long strings of numbers that are pretty hard to remember, but are very easy to manage for computers. And a uh, system of domain names, the ones that we use today in .com, the google.com or facebook.com, that are simpler to understand for humans. And there is a whole system that basically matches those real word names with the numbers that the machines understand. This is called the domain name system. And to manage this domain name system, there are a certain number of entities. There are five so-called regional internet registries that distribute the IP addresses. Um, they're located in the various regions of the world. They have their own policies for distributing those addresses so that they are given to ISPs, they are given to uh, companies, and so on. That's the way the internet functions technically. And in order to make it understandable by humans, there are other entities that are called registries that basically manage the names. Examples of such registries are VeriSign, that manage the .com, that we all know. Uh, PIR, Public Internet Registry, that manages the .org, that you know. And there are other, including what are called country code top-level domains, uh, the ones that you use in your country, .in for India, for instance, but it's .fr for France, .br for Brazil, and so on. All these entities, about a little bit more than 200, are called registries. When you buy a domain name in .com, you don't buy it from VeriSign. You actually buy it through actors who are called registrars. Uh, it's not really retail and wholesale, but there's an analogy of that sort. When you buy those domain names, you can buy it from a registrar that is located almost anywhere in the world. 
even if you're based in India, you can actually buy it from a registrar that is based in the US uh, for a top-level domain that is based in another country. There are hundreds of those registrars. And one of the challenges is to make sure that this system functions correctly and that there's coordination among, among those. This is why we talk about an ecosystem. I should mention that in addition, there are other types of structures that basically deal with the standards and the protocols. And the most well-known of them are the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which develops the standards for the TCP IP protocol. And the World Wide Web Consortium, which as the name implies, is developing collaboratively the protocols for the World Wide Web. So you see there is a landscape of actors, and the role of ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which has been created in 1999, 98, sorry, is to, in its bylaws, to coordinate the allocation of those unique identifiers. It is a very loose coordination regarding the allocation of Internet addresses, because the regional Internet registries have a large autonomy. It is a slightly more uh, organized coordination for the country code uh, domains who have their own organization within ICANN called the CCNSO, the Country Code Names Supporting Organization. And it is a much stronger role in a certain way for what is called generic top-level domains, the .com, .org, .net, and a whole range of other TLDs that have been introduced or will be introduced uh, that are so-called global or generic top-level domains. The interesting thing is that this coordination role, um, to simplify, can be described as several different steps. One function is what I call a notary function. Basically, it's keeping the records straight. And one of the most important records to make the whole internet addressing system function is called the root zone file. It is a very simple uh, list that connects the registry with the entity and the address, the internet address, of who manages the records for that registry. For instance, for .com, it is very signed. For PIR, it is for .org, sorry, it's PIR. For .fr, it's AFNIC. For .br, it's CGIVR. And there is a very simple file that is updated very regularly that basically says, if you're looking for a domain name in .com, you should ask, very sign, who has the so-called second level domain in .com. For instance, when you type facebook.com in your browser, it basically says who, oh, who is managing .com? Then it goes to the root zone file, and the root zone file says it's VeriSign that manages .com. Then you send a second request to VeriSign, and it says, you're managing .com, who is actually managing facebook.com? And VeriSign's database says to your computer, oh, facebook.com, we know, it's a company called Facebook, and their servers are at the following IP address. And then your computer and your browser can send the request to the servers of facebook.com. That's the whole architecture of the system, which is called a hierarchical addressing system. In practice, though, it functions a little bit more simply because your internet access provider actually doesn't want to have you ask every time to the root zone file and every time to VeriSign where is Facebook.com because there are thousands of people who ask for this address so they do what is called caching which means that basically they keep their own database of the most commonly used addresses so that they can direct you directly. That being said, it is extremely important that the root zone file the short list of who manages each registry is kept very, very safe, very, very secure, and very, very accurate. This is what is called the IANA function, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. 
ICANN is in charge of this function. It's the notary function. And every time, for instance, a CCTLD operator for India is changing the address of its servers, it sends the modification to ICANN, which validates it, and then it goes into the root zone file. Likewise, if in a country there's a change of who manages this country code top-level domain, it sends the request for modification to ICANN, ICANN verifies it, and the update is being made. That's the notary function. It's a very clerical function, but a very important function that guarantees the integrity of the root zone file. And as a further explanation of the ecosystem, there's not only one server for this root zone file. Actually, there are 13 operators around the world. A significant number is in the US, but there are also others in other regions of the world. And each of those major servers are actually replicated in hundreds of mirrors around the world. So that it's again a distributed system. The important role of ICANN is to make sure that the file that is being spread daily to all those actors is absolutely uh, clear and accurate. The second function that ICANN is performing is what I call the regulatory function of allocating the semantic spectrum. You may have heard about a program called the new GTLD program. There are almost legacy uh, top-level domains, the .com, .org, .net, .edu, and others that existed from the inception of the internet. Others have been added since then in several rounds in the, between 2000 and, and 2004, uh, like .info, .jobs, .coop, .museum, and so on. In 2008, and then later in 2011, ICANN has launched a very ambitious program for allowing the opening up of the domain name space, which is a common global resource. And so there will probably be, uh, it's still under process, but there will probably be uh, .sports, uh, .paris, um, names for uh, brands as well, without naming any, uh, probably more than a thousand new top-level domains will be introduced. And ICANN has developed a policy collaboratively to process the request for uh, opening up those new domains. And if you think about it as it is about names and words, it can be called a semantic spectrum. It's a little bit like the allocation of the uh, radio spectrum for uh, telecom operators. It is a global common resource, and the goal is to make sure that the allocation and the management of this global common resource is done in the best global public interest. So this is the second function, defining the rules for the allocation of the semantic spectrum and the opening up of the domain name space. The third function is basically to organize the market or the market-based mechanisms for the distribution of those domains and the domains at the second level. I mentioned the registrars, and so just like there are registry agreements with the managers of the domain names at the top level, there are also agreements with the people who make those accessible to users and registrants, i.e. when you buy a domain name from a registrar, like GoDaddy, for instance, or uh, Inam, they, these registrars, actually have a contract with ICANN, which is called the Registrar Accreditation Agreement. And if you buy a domain name at the second level in the new, in a generic top-level domain, uh, you can buy only from an accredited registrar by ICANN. And so this whole set of rules regarding how the market is organized for the distribution of domain, sorry, domain names is basically playing the role of uh, competition uh, authority and basically setting the rules for the market, including in terms of compliance and redress of uh, misbehavior. The fourth element is that, of course, uh, there are issues and disputes. And so ICANN has pioneered uh, a while ago, pretty early on, a procedure called the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure, UDRP, 
that allows, for instance, a company or any other actor who believes that somebody has registered a domain name in an infringing manner to their copyright or um, to their rights in general to basically get it back or prevent this person to misuse it. Without getting into detail, it's an international dispute resolution mechanism, that, set of mechanisms, that is managed, among others, by the World Intellectual Property Organization and other actors, so that when you have a dispute, instead of resolving the dispute about a second level domain name in courts, which sometimes is difficult to determine and can be a lengthy procedure, you go to a UDRP process, which is handled by panels on another basis for, for each case. And in a new GTLD program, there is an additional procedure that has been introduced, or that is being introduced, called the um, Universal Rapid Suspension uh, Procedure, which is a sort of light UDRP in case of blatant abuse of registration of domain names. So the notary function, to make sure that the root zone file is um, accurate, the allocation of the semantic spectrum in the opening up of the new GTLD and the management of the naming space. Competition and compliance, market rules for how those domain names are being distributed. And dispute resolution mechanisms when there are conflicts between people who register domain names. That's what ICANN does. But as I said in the beginning, it is an innovative governance system. It's part of an ecosystem of governance, but it is also innovative and rather unique in the way it functions for several reasons. The first reason is that this is a global public interest mission. And the strange thing is that this global public interest mission is managed by an entity that is technically and legally a non-profit corporation based in the US. There are two reasons for that. One is historic, because when it was created in 1998, it was actually an incorporation of sorts of a function that was performed by one person called John Postel, uh, who was basically the INA manager at the time, in the very early days. And so, because it was based in the US, it was based in California, the, co the corporation, the entity, was incorporated in California, actually in the place where he was living, which is Marina del Rey in California. But there's a second reason for that, which is that if you want to create an international agency or an organization, unless you are an intergovernmental body, there's no way you can create an international organization from scratch. So it has to be incorporated in one country. And so the country that was chosen at the time was, was the US, but it, is, it has to be understood that it is because there is no framework today to create an international structure in itself. So a strange system where global public interest function is being performed by a private-based entity in one country. The second thing is that it is regulation by contract. This is very strange. It's basically establishing the rules for the market, the allocation of the domain name space, who manages them and so on, through contracts with the registries and the registrars that are actually discussed and established in cooperation with the ones who are going to be, of course, submitted to those contracts. So it's a very strange thing. It's not self-regulation by the entities themselves. It is not regulation by a governmental entity. It is a cooperative exercise that collectively and collaboratively defines the rules that will apply to uh, the management of a global resource. So the second original component is um, regulation by contract. The third element is the so-called multi-stakeholder nature of, of this process. ICANN is a very strange um, organization in a certain way. We have three meetings per year that gather about 1,500 people plus from all around the world, which basically come together to discuss those policies, how they are implemented, and so on. And anybody can participate in the ICANN process. And when I mean anybody, I really mean anybody, either physically or remotely. 
There's no particular accreditation process. If you are interested, and you should be, I suppose, you can participate, follow remotely or online or physically during meetings the activities of ICANN. Every activity is actually um, recorded. Uh, the discussions in the working groups and in the sessions are often transcribed fully and accessible online. And there's a huge amount of information and transparency regarding the organization and its openness. The next thing that is a little bit original is that it is an international structure that is not intergovernmental, but where governments are participating, although it's a private structure, and they are participating through something that is called the Governmental Advisory Committee. Between 2006 and 2010, I was the representative of France in the Governmental Advisory Committee and its vice chair for, for two years. And to be frank, there are a lot of governments who were initially very ill at ease about the notion that in a quasi-regulatory function, governments would have an advisory role. So there's still a lot of concern or, or sometimes irritation about this term. The fact is that through the years, and especially in the recent uh, times, not only has the number of governments participating in the Governmental Advisory Committee considerably grown up to more than 120, or I think today, which encompass all the major uh, countries, that includes China, that includes uh, Brazil, um, Russia, India, of course, and, 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 and European Union and US. But basically, all together, they represent probably 95% um, of the population of people who are using the internet. And so, not only is it very representative now, but it is um, growing in, I think, respect and engagement inside the structure. And the governments are discovering how a dedicated uh, structure of that sort can be useful for them as well. The example I always give to, to governments who say, uh, we are not really comfortable with, with this, uh, is if there were no such thing as I can, there would be no accreditation regime for the registrars in the different countries. And without this accreditation regime and the compliance that goes with it, a government would have no power to address the misbehavior of a registrar based in another country. This is an instrument that is at the benefit of all the different actors concerned, including the governments. And the evolution of the role of governments within ICANN is a very interesting topic that is uh, an ongoing um, uh, issue. The last point I want to highlight in terms of the originality of the structure is that as an incorporated California-based entity, it has a board. But you know how boards are composed normally in, in corporations. It's a cooptation. It's basically... Um, the founders of the entity or the, the main shareholders of the entity that select other directors. In ICANN there are no shareholders. There's not even a membership structure. There are constituencies within the organization, the constituencies of the people who are the registries, the constituency of the people who are the registrars, but also constituencies about people who are uh, concerned or interested with intellectual property, uh, the business constituency, there's an at-large constituency that concerns the users, there's a non-commercial user constituency, many subgroups where people fit according to where they're coming from and which stakeholder group they are coming from. And the fascinating notion is that the board of ICANN, which is an international board with people from really uh, various places in the world, 15 people, uh, are designated by the participants through two channels, without getting into details, you can see that in the additional material online. Some of the seats on the board are coming from the constituencies through various election processes. And another part, almost half, a bit more than half of the board, is actually designated by an original structure that is called the nominating committee. I have been elected on the ICANN board through the nominating committee. And it's basically a group of people that are coming from the community. They are nominated or elected to be part of the nominating committee. And this nominating committee as a whole 
designate half of the board. This is a very original structure, and I think it's one component of the legitimacy of, uh, of the organization that the whole community actually contributes to the election of the, of the board. I should add that as part of the board, there are five liaisons, and those liaisons are coming from the technical community, including, for instance, the root server operators, the IETF or the W3C, but also the chairman of the governmental uh, advisory committee, actually a chairwoman at the moment, is ex officio a liaison to the ICANN board. So it's a very, it's a slightly complex structure, honestly, if you want to, to get into it, but I hope that this has clarified a little bit what it does, how it works, and why it's original. And to finish, I would like to move the camera a little bit wider even. I said that ICANN is only dealing with a subset of the ecosystem of the logical layer. ICANN doesn't deal with content at all. It deals with the naming and numbering system. But if you broaden the scope further, what we've talked about is the governance of the internet. There's a whole field above in the application and content layer, which is governance on the internet. How do you manage and address the issues that are related to freedom of expression, uh, privacy, copyright, um, uh, cybercrime, and so on? In this regard, the whole system I describe, the regional internet registry, the registrar, the registries, ICANN, and so on, IETF and W3C, they don't deal with content. They don't deal with the governance on the internet. And the challenge that we're facing is that there is no real intergovernmental institution that can deal with those issues in a multi-stakeholder manner, which is needed, because most of those issues can only be solved if all the different actors are around the table, the way ICANN is doing it for the domain name system. One fascinating experiment that has been launched in 2006, after the World Summit on the Information Society, is the Internet Governance Forum. And the Internet Governance Forum is a space where issues and policy issues re regarding, among others, governance on the Internet are being discussed. I won't get into details. You probably will have another video on this, uh, on this topic in the, in the course. But it is important to see that ICANN and the IGF are two laboratories for new types of governance mechanisms. And in particular, what um, I think is going to become very important is that the lessons that we can draw from ICANN are that we should gather actors on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. It is not about creating institutions to govern the internet, quote-unquote, with one institution governing every aspect related to the internet. The internet is not an issue, it's a space. And there are many different issues, and the best way to handle them is to have groupings of stakeholders that are concerned by a fundamental topic. The multi-stakeholder governance mechanism is based on one fundamental principle, which is the right of any person or entity to participate in an appropriate manner in the governance mechanisms dealing with the issues that they are concerned with. That's the fundamental basis of the multi-stakeholder approach to governance. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I am the director of an internet and jurisdiction project that is an issue-based uh, network, is trying to catalyze an issue-based network to deal with the tension between uh, the cross-border internet and the patchwork of national jurisdictions. And I think that you, have, you will have in the course another uh, video on this. So the final message is, this is a fascinating new environment and a period where, as rarely in history, we are at a time where we're trying to design global, transnational governance mechanisms that are not exclusively intergovernmental, that are associating all the different stakeholders. And as a law student, I think it's a field that you should really think about as a career path. Thank you.